Okay, looking for approval of the agenda. Madam President, I move to approve the agenda as pre prepared by the Agenda Planning Committee. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Harding. Is a second? Second. Seconded? Yes. You, Can I? I you can't. don't want to. Okay, then I won't. Well. Second. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any discussion on the approval of the agenda? Madam Gasford. Madam President, I'd like to um, pull number four on the the uh, CIP agenda out. The consent agenda? consent agenda. Yes. So number four is the bid on the Claudie Kitchen. Yes. Okay. And you'd like to pull that for a separate vote? Yes, please. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any uh, discussion or explanation, Mr. Gesford? Yes, I'm just pointing that because I um, have a small business partnership with Mr. Stamper. So you'll be recusing yourself? Yes, I will be recusing myself. Okay. Very good. The motion is to sever out number four on the consent agenda uh, and move it to be considered as a separate item. All those in favor? Seven zero. Student member concurs. Okay, back to the major agenda motion. Any further discussion or changes? All those in favor, as amended. Seven zero. Very good. Thank you. And the minutes? Yes, Madam President, I move for approval of the minutes that are in our board packet for the business meeting that was held on August 4th, 2015, and the closed session that was held that same day, Tuesday, August 4th, 2015. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Requires a second? Second. Thank you. Mr. Gasford, any discussion? The motion is on the approval of the minutes. All those in favor? 7-0 and student concurs. Okay. We're on to public comment and we have one person signed up, Mr. Neil Becker. If you would come forward, please. You pick one. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. I've already shared. I think you have hard copies. Just mm -hmm. Does everyone have a copy at their? Okay. Good afternoon. Welcome again. Uh, I hope you're as excited about the new school year as I am. Uh, my first few weeks as the WCTA, the Washington County Teachers Association president, have been very busy, but they've been rewarding as well. Getting used to the new job is challenging for the last 22 years. Uh, this day is the last teacher day, and it was spent getting ready for kids. So. Many of you understand that feeling when you're out of the classroom that, what now? Mm. So it, it's, but I'm, I'm making it through and, and suffering a little bit of withdrawal, you know, that school withdrawal, that kid withdrawal, but um, I'll make it through. Um, first today, I extend uh, to all Washington County Public Schools employees best wishes for a successful school year without the commitment of our teachers counselors, support staff, drivers, everyone in the system, administrators, all employees, our system will not achieve success and our students will not enjoy their educational experience. So thank you for your dedication to our community. Additionally, uh, I welcome all the new staff. I doubt they're watching now because it's a daytime meeting and they're all in their classrooms getting ready to go. But I welcome all new staff who have joined Washington County Public Schools this year. I enjoy meeting uh, many new teachers and counselors during New Teacher Academy just last week. Though I'm far removed from my own experience as that rookie teacher, I remember that feeling and I still get some of those beginning of the year butterflies every year and even this year, even though I'm not going to be with kids, I have a few of those butterflies. I also extend a very public thank you to Joni Burkhart and the staff members, uh, countless staff members. I'm not going to try to name names as I recall who I saw, 
but they organized and executed just a, an, an outstanding new teacher academy. I got to sit in in some of the workshops. Um, their efforts allow staff to get off on the right foot, and I, as a WCTA president, really appreciate the opportunity to work with the NTA planners um, and present information to the newly hired teachers. It was a good experience for me and I think for the new hires as well. And finally, I look forward to a rewarding year as association president. I invite each of you, the board members, even the student member, if you want to get together on lunchtime, we can do that. I'll write you a note to get out of class. Um, contact me if there's anything you'd like to chat about anytime. Just you, you know how to reach me. Uh, we might not always agree on things, um, but the only way we're going to know about anything and whether we agree or disagree is by talking things out. So feel free. Uh, my door is always open. I heard that from my previous administrator, and it worked out great because his door was, and we talked a lot. So thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak today, and I'm looking forward to a great year. I'm a great tenure as president. Thank you, Mr. Becker. Um, stay seated a moment. We'll move right on to board member comments. Yes, Ms. Fisher. I remember your first day as a rookie teacher. <laughs> I, I remember it too. You were there. Um, anyhow, I just want to wish you the best of luck in your new role. Thank you, Jackie. I appreciate that. Thank you. Other comments? Mr. Becker, again, thank you for coming today and um, starting off the relationship. And uh, I was at the New Teacher Academy, as were several of my colleagues, and I uh, appreciated your being there, and you reached out to all of our members that were there and actually sat down with Dr. Wilcox and Dr. Hardings and myself. And I believe, Mr. Reidenauer, were you there at that moment or not? So really appreciate the outreach, and as we move forward, uh, finishing up, concluding negotiations, and starting a new round. Yep, I look forward to it. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. All right. Okay, there is no unfinished business, so we're going right into new business and to the amended consent agenda. Mrs. Freeman. I'll try to be as equally enthusiastic about the new year. We have five, um, excuse me, six items now on the amended consent agenda. The items were discussed at the Procurement Review Committee on August 11th. And the superintendents authorized us to move forward with these on your agenda today. And we have staff in the, available in the room. If you have any questions about those six items, be, there, I'm referring to items one through three and items five through seven. Thank you. Um, looking for a motion on the one, two, three, five, six, and seven. Madam President, I move to approve the contract's bids for creating a culture of inclusion, training to max life at $51,639, 200 wireless arrays, software and support to Bell Tech Logics at $109,710, PSAT tests to College Board at $51,999. $997.50, frozen beverages and equipment to Ridgefield's brand corporation at mixed unit prices up to $70,000 annually, computers and devices to Apple Incorporated at $112,132.17, and 100 desktop computers to HCGI at $45,400. Thank you, Dr. Harding. So second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Reidenauer. Okay. Discussion? Questions? Mrs. Harshman. I just have a question about um, the creating a culture for inclusion training. Um, does this uh, affect also the board members? We had asked about the possibility of having um, that extended to the board. does not include board members at this time, but I, I know that is a discussion that, that you all have had, um, so we would need direction from you as to whether or not you want to be included. Thank you. My, my understanding is we haven't had a um, general agreement on moving forward on that point, but thank you for that clarification. Go ahead. And will that then alter the amount? 
No, because we did not include board members. So the amount, it, I guess, if you decided to, we would have to amend or just work, you know, work to include that in a future contract. <coughs> okay. And um, is there something that is used to gauge the um, success of this program at the end? Yes, for the training that will take place with the teachers and the paraprofessionals throughout the year, we will have um, a, a feedback form um, on site um, or electronically afterwards and ask people to provide us their feedback and, and um, information about the effectiveness of the program, whether or not they believe that it's engaging, appropriate, any suggestions for improvement, things like that. Okay. Thank you. Sure. <coughs> Additional questions, Ms. Harshman? Um, no, that's it. Thank you. Other, Ms. Fisher? Um, I understand the maintenance department and the food and beverage um, folks have already had this training, and I, um, I believe I sent a question. I was wondering if they have provided any feedback yet. We, maybe there hasn't been time for that to occur on the appropriate misengagement and so on. Um, yes, and actually, just to clarify, it was just food and nutrition so far. Um, they had professional development days pr already scheduled for last week, so we were able to build into that schedule, which was great because everybody was in one place at one time. Um, and so we had about 200 people participate in a two-hour training. And we have not collected survey data yet, but we did a, an informal focus group with nine um, participants from four different schools yesterday. And we did get um, some very positive feedback. The presenters were found to be enthusiastic, knowledgeable, um, sharing their experiences, um, able to pull experiences and feedback out of the participants. Um, staff seemed enthused and, and were into the conversations, whether that was the large group or the small group. Um, one person said the two hours flew by very quickly. Some people stayed after to speak to the presenters individually. Um, and we asked if the training, if they felt the training was necessary, and there was a resounding yes. Um, they know that there's more diversity in the county than ever before. Uh, they felt that the trainers made them feel valuable, um, and that we are important in the lives of the kids at our schools. So I think from that perspective, at least, you could say it was a success. It's good to hear. Thank you. Sure. Additional questions? Ms. Williams. Yes, I have a question about the 100 desktop computers. Reading here in the summary, it says that these computers are needed to replace the aging computers for business education programs. So my question is, how many of these 100 will go for that purpose, and then what does it mean by general administration? Does that mean that these will be used in offices for secretarial use, or? You have it exactly correct. We have three labs of 30 computers each that we intend to replace with desktop units. So 30, 30, and 30, and then there'll be 10 to replace older computers scattered throughout the system. Uh, could be administrative assistants, it could be administrators. And then I have a question about um, the um, Apple products, the Apple computers. It says that they're going to various schools. Can you tell me where they're going? We have a long list of schools that they're going to, probably eight or nine different schools. Most of these are purchased with PTA funds, school funds. Uh, these are not uh, necessarily board purchased. One of the things we've been trying to do is make sure that we take advantage of our discount price with Apple. Uh, we get the best price when we package things and depend upon whether it's iPads or whether it's computers in fives or tens. So when someone orders two and someone else orders two, we try to collect that into a group of five or ten, uh, depending upon the nature of the product, and we receive a very good price for those products. So this is just a, a combination of, I know Smithburg's involved and Paramount's involved. We have a couple for a couple art teachers. Uh, it's, it's just a list of eight or ten different places these computers are going. Thank you, Dr. Michael. Any additional questions? Ms. Williams? No, thank you. Any other? Dr. Harding? Yes, I have a few. First, on the uh, creating a culture for inclusion, could 
Could somebody on the staff or Dr. Wilcox or somebody explain what Title II funds are for those in the public who may not understand, first of all, and second of all, as I understand, this training is a uh, mandate that's come down from the state. Can you talk a little bit about that, just so that people have some context to, I mean, it, it, I think this expenditure fits well with some of the discussion the board's had, especially uh, pertaining to minority hiring and the diversity task force. So it fits there, but I think there is another component, which is this has become a priority of the state which has been sent down to local school systems and how Title II funding fits into that. Is, can somebody speak to that to I can, help make I can that clear? Ask, or I can ask Dr. Hay Jamie, why don't you come forward? I guess I just gave you a field degree, didn't I, Dr. Hayden? <laughs> um, but Dr. Harding, you're exactly right. This is part of a new requirement um, that just happened to coincide with the board's general direction of helping to build a more inclusive environment. Jamie, would you speak to the state requirements? Absolutely. Um, first of all, the what is Title II funding? Uh, Title II funding is for teacher preparation. It gives additional professional development. It's funding from the federal government. Um, it's to help teachers and to help administration. So as Dr. Wilcox was talking about, uh, stipulations come from the federal government and when they give the money to MSDE, MSDE also places stipulations in order for us to receive it. And this year, a new stipulation is in order for us to receive the funding is we need to have some type of a, use a certain percentage and they have not said you have to use a certain amount of percentage yet because this is something new that um, it goes towards a diversity training. And that's where Laura kind of popped in and said, hey, we were gonna do this and we all work together with the funding and the funding was there. That's great, that's, that's very helpful. Does that, just, does that, just so that everybody understands that there are, I think there are two pieces of this. One which fits, I think, our new vision and some of the discussions we had. Another that has become a state priority and for people to understand that the funding for this comes from federal, federal grant dollars by way of Title II. Um, that those funds pay for other things like uh, Mr. Becker mentioned the new teacher academy yes. uh, provides funding for those types of events things to help teachers and administrators improve their craft and and, and uh, work in our system so I just thought it was important for the the public to understand that to the 100 desktop computers um, what caught my eye on that was desktop computers I know it's a very good price at 450 dollars a piece or so you can get laptops for just about the same price is is there some reason we chose this is it just they were desktop computers so we're going to replace them with desktop and I guess the broader question is when we go through a replacement cycle like this do we have an internal process that says okay let's really think about what those devices are let's think about what their purpose is what we're replacing was bought seven years ago is there another technology or another method that we can use to provide the same capability without just doing a we're getting rid of these laptops or, or these desktops we're going to put in a, another bunch yeah I, I think staff puts a great deal of thought into not only the business lab computers but like cad computers i mean we're very specific with the programs and the curriculum that's going to be used on the computers and they're matching uh what the board i believe has shared with us and certainly dr wilcox you know the best use the best device to the best application and that's the purpose uh, in this purchase. Okay, and that, that decision comes through? George Phillips uh, and, you know, for business lab computers and CAD labs and for the teachers themselves. We have hardwired labs, you know, direct connected. Um, I don't know what more information to share than that. I don't, I don't know what our advantage would be to be a laptop based on what the use of the computers right now in this setting. I can think of a lot of advantages, but if, if the decision is made that a desktop is the best device for this particular application, then you know, I'll trust staff to make that judgment. You know, memory's considered, you know, the capacity of the computer, the size of the monitor, all those things based on the application are all considered in the decision making. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Additional questions? <clears throat> Just a, Mr. Ridenauer. Excuse me, Jamie. <clears throat> Title II funding, how much, just off the top of your head, approximately how much Title II funding do we get in total 
for each? For 750,000. $750, okay, thank you. All right, we're uh, the motion on the floor is Dr. Harding's, and it's the amended consent agenda. There's no additional questions. All those in favor? Looks like 7 0, and the student member concurs. And now we have the motion on the single item. Yes, bid 2016-01 is a solicitation that was issued by the purchasing department to renovate the uh, outdoor, the fire tower at the Fair Claudie Kitchens Outdoor School. Uh, we had two contractors submit bids for the project. Work involves a replacement of the existing angle, angles and hardware where specified with new replacement angles and hardware, replacing stair treads and wood landings, inspection and installation of grounding rods. Um, work we anticipate will begin shortly after the issuance of the notice to proceed and be completed by the end of November. We're recommending the award be made to Milton Stamper Builders at a total cost of $119,625. He's our apparent lowest responsive and responsible bidder. Thank you. A motion, please. Madam President, I move to approve the award of the Cla Claude E. Kitchens Fire Tower Resp Restoration to Milton Stamper Builders at $119,625. Thank you, Dr. Hardings. A second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Fisher. Any discussion on this item? Yes, Ms. Harshman. I just have a question. Is the um, fire tower in use currently? In other words, for the opening of school? It is not. It is not? It has not been in use for a couple years. Okay, so it won't interfere with any uh, usage that we would normally have because it's not being used. <coughs> when it's complete, it'll actually, you know, reestablish usage of the tower. Good. Okay. Thank you. Mrs. Williams, could you speak to the use of the tower and how that's integral to the program offered at the outdoor school? I, I can't speak specifically how they use the tower right now, but I know that they always have a day that they go up the tower. They talk about what you can see from the tower. They used to talk about, you know, what fire towers, how why fire towers were used. Uh, this tower was relocated. I can't remember from where, like Gaithersburg or, or I mean, that direction. Uh, at some point, it was brought here uh, and um, erected. And it's deteriorated some and just needs some work, and that's what we're doing right now. But I, I don't know the specific curriculum, but I know the kids are very excited when they go. I've walked up the tower a number of times with children uh, back in my days when I was at Clear Spring, but that's been too long ago to say for sure how it's used in curriculum right now. Thank you. Any other tower stories? <laughs> Sorry. Ms. Brightman, I'm going to tell my tower Absolutely. story. Absolutely. <laughs> I was going to tell it anyway. I'm, I'm thrilled to see this on the, on the list. Uh, I think. It's one of those things that you, where children learn things in different environments that they may not learn the same way in the classroom. Uh, when I was there with my son, when he was in the fifth grade, I stayed the week with them. And the one day we climbed the fire tower. And I was glad to volunteer to go up with them. Uh, and for those who haven't seen it, it's tall. I mean, you, you get to the top of the treetops and you're maybe a third of the way there. Uh, so I was climbing up with a group of students, and this girl who was fairly shy got to the point where she was above the treetops and just grabbed on and panicked. I mean, you could tell if you're at all afraid of heights, that's when it hits you. And she was. So I spent about the next 10, 15 minutes with her, gradually walking her up one flight at a time. You know, keep your eyes on me, don't look down. And she got more and more and more scared. But we got her all the way to the top. And as word circulated down the tower that this little girl was, was afraid, all the kids down below started cheering her name and chanting and cheering her on. We got her all the way to the top of there. And the look on her face when she looked out and saw the mountains, saw the trees. We were there in the fall. They were all changing colors. She had a look of pride and confidence on her face that just I, I'll never forget. Um, 
we walked back down. Uh, all the kids cheered for her when she got down. And to this day, she's a sophomore in high school now, every time I see her, she looks at me and she says, we made it up that tower, didn't we? <laughs> so those are the kinds of lessons I think that you can learn in a place like that. Not just the cohesion of the class, but you know, maybe that girl the following Monday in school had the courage to ask a question in a class or to participate in some way that she might not have but for that experience. Um, so I, I enthusiastically support the tower. Uh, I support kids climbing the tower. And uh, I'm just thrilled that finally we're going to get it back into operation. Because when my other daughter went, it wasn't in use. They couldn't climb it. And I thought that was an experience that they really missed. So thanks for bringing this forward. <coughs> Excellent. Any other comments on this single item? All right. All those in favor of the motion? 7 0. Student, six. excuse me, 6. And abstention or recusal? Recusal. Okay, thank you. Okay, 6 4. Student concurs with the majority, and we have one recusal. Thank you. Thank you. I got so wrapped up in the tower story that I lost track of <laughs> counting the votes correctly, so I apologize. Um, moving on to the donation of science equipment, Dr. Pugh, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm here to ask for your consideration of a donation of science equipment estimated at a value of $10,898 Sorry, from Opgen Incorporated of Gaithersburg, Maryland. Uh, they've listed out the items that you can see before you. If you have any questions. Uh, a motion to accept this donation. Madam President, I move to approve a gift of science equipment with an estimated value of $10,898 to Washington County Public Schools from OpGen Incorporated of Gaithersburg, Maryland. Thank you, Ms. Fisher. A second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Reidenauer. Any questions or comments? Mrs. Bright, I just want to thank Opgen for doing this. That's a group that I see when I go to trade shows frequently. They're a, a biotech company down in uh, the 270 corridor. Uh, their executive assistant I know lives in Washington County, and that's how this connection came through. I want to thank them for thinking of us, and I look forward to seeing them at the next trade show. Excellent. Any other questions or comments? Okay. All those in favor of Mrs. Fisher's motion, please signify. 7-0, student concurs. And again, give our thanks to Objen. Oh, Appreciate it. All right, we're on to some policy work. Mr. Trotta, welcome. We have some first reads. Yes, thank you. The Policy Committee conducted a review of policy IGBA, which concerns special education, and is recommending that it be rescinded because this topic is covered extensively by both federal and state law. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. A motion for this first read. Madam President, I move to approve the first reading to rescind policy IGBA. It's entitled Programs for Handicapped Students. Thank you. A second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Reidenauer. Discussion? Questions? Okay. All those in favor of this first read? 7-0, student concurs. Thank you. On to the next first read. Thank you. The Policy Committee examined policies AF, it's entitled Commitment to Accomplishment, policy AD, philosophy of education and policy IA, instructional goals and learning objectives in light of the recent recommendation offered by the Ad Hoc Committee on Communication that the Board of Education adopt a handbook. This handbook would provide vital information to members of the board with regard to their responsibilities and the mission of the Board of Education. The three policies that are under review at this time address the board's expectations its mission and its philosophy. 
The members of the policy committee are recommending that these three policies be rescinded and that the concepts that are set forth therein be considered for inclusion in the handbook that the board will be developing. The policy committee also requested that I provide you with an overview as to their recommendation with regard to how the process would move forward with regard to the handbook. The first is that the policy committee will develop a list of topics that would be included in the handbook. That document would then be shared with the entire board and all the members would be requested to provide comments and <coughs> suggestions as to whether additional topics should be covered in the handbook. Next, the policy committee in consultation with staff would develop the first draft of the handbook. Once that draft was completed, the policy committee will be recommending to the board that it conduct a public work session so that it may examine the draft and offer comments and suggestions. In conclusion, in light of the recommendation offered by the policy committee, it's being recommended this time that these three policies be rescinded. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trotto. Motion. Madam President, I move for approval of the first reading to rescind policy AD entitled Philosophy of Education, policy AF entitled Commitment to Accomplishment, and policy IA entitled Instructional Goals and Learning Objectives. Thank you. A second? Second. Right now. Questions? Yes, Ms. Fisher. Um, I don't have a question. I just have a comment. These um, policies also do not um, reflect our current vision um, and are therefore, for the most part, inappropriate. Um, that's part of the reason we are recommending rescission. Thank you. Mrs. Williams. Uh, you're saying all three, all three of those policies don't reflect our current vision? No, it's mostly the philosophy of education. Okay. Um, but we think that the three tend to go together. They work together, and therefore they should be rewritten, and, and we're recommending that they be included in the handbook rather than as policies. Question, Ms. Williams. Um, I agree. I, I, I do feel they need to re, be revised, um, in particular policy AD, the philosophy of education. Um, I would prefer to see these three remain in policy and not become part of the handbook. Um, I think policy is a very different thing than uh, reference material, which is what would be in the handbook. So I'm going to be voting against the rescission of these three policies. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Okay, the motion, uh, the question is on Mrs. Fisher's motion. All those in favor? Like four, the student is with concurring with that. Those opposed? Looks like three opposed. The motion moves forward. Thank, Thank you. you. We now move to consideration of the capital improvement program for FY 2017. Dr. Michael, Mr. Rollins. Mr. Criswell, welcome. Good afternoon, President Brightman, uh, Dr. Harding's members of the board, Dr. Wilcox. We're here today requesting your approval of the local and state CIP request for the coming year. Uh, this is a very familiar slide to all of you. You know that part of our goal as, uh, in developing the CIP is to address any modernization, uh, renovation type projects we might have. Seat capacity is always something we're looking at if there's an area that needs seat capacity. Systemic projects, keeping the envelope of the building sealed up, doors, windows, uh, roof projects, also keeping our HVAC, heating, ventilating, air conditioning uh, systems in excellent condition and reliable. And then one of the strategies that Washington County has consistently employed as, is to try to maximize the use of state funding. 
the CIP is a sister document. Uh, we talked about the Comprehensive Maintenance Plan, which Mark Mills will bring forward in October, the CIP that's brought forward to you today for consideration. But all these are companion documents to the Educational Master Plan that the Board approved uh, back at the first meeting in June. Two new pieces of information, the state per square footage cost has increased uh, substantially this year. Uh, the construction cost has increased to $282 and site work is generally about 17% of that or $54 per square foot. Uh, this is based on the information the state gathers throughout the, excuse me, the IAC gathers throughout the state. Uh, they collect all the information on all the buildings and track what's happening with square, square footage cost and they're seeing a substantial increase in costs in various projects and that's why the state has increased the what they will participate in as far as a square foot cost. Uh, our 71%, which has been the state participation in our project as far as eligible cost, uh, was renewed again and we continue at 71%. Run that for me. Sure. So our first project, Jonathan Hager, uh, requests both locally and state will be for a total of $2,450,000. That breaks down into our final request to the state of 683,000. We fully expect the state will um, fund their full state share. Our local share is already reflected in the county's budget or future budget for FY17 of $1,767,000. Project's well on our way, it's on budget, it's on time, and we're very pleased with the product so far. Our next request is for a partial roof replacement at South High. Approximately 50% of the roof at South will be replaced. Uh, staff has researched the roof at South High. There's about five or six different times the roof and different roof portions have been replaced at South High. Our intention at this point is to replace about 50% of the roof. Uh, you can see the state cost would be about 900 plus thousand and locally would be close to 600,000. Most of this work won't be completed until the summer of 17, but we do have a portion of the roof that's in poor condition, uh, about 6,000 square feet. We'll probably separate that out as part of this project and try to do that next summer if at all possible. The remainder of the roof, the balance <coughs> of the 50% of the roof, depending upon its condition, you may see show back up in FY19. Uh, HVAC project, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning project at Hancock. Those units are original to the building. Mark Mills reports constant rust and, uh, you know, pipe corrosion and those types of things. So it's time to replace those units. That'll be approximately a $3 million project. You can see the breakout of the state share will be about 1.8 and locally about a million dollars. Always on the local side, remember we pay for all architect and engineering fees. That's why that 71% seems a little bit skewed. And there's other ineligible costs that are also on our side that aren't part of the state side. Similar project at Boonesboro Elementary, very similar uh, type of units will be replaced, about $1.8 million. Again, you can see the state share, about 1.1, and locally about 700,000. Funkstown roof replacement, much smaller than South Hagerstown High School. Uh, and you can see our split on that's about $300,000 and about $180,000. Based on the educational master plan back in the spring that we presented to the board and was approved, we did include the academic hub um, and we did put it just as to be determined. We, as the board's aware, we do have two proposals the process of being considered will be brought forward to the board in the very near future for determination of what proposal will be used. Um, TBD has been used both for state and local amounts. We don't know if we're going to pursue any state funding on that project as of yet. And of course, the amount would be determined upon uh, the bid proposals and the information provided to the board here in the future. Uh, we'd anticipate the potential of this project opening in 2018. Um, if we were to move forward uh, in the next couple months with the project. We wanted to include this slide. You've seen this before. We try to keep a running total. Of what has our request been of the state? This is all state request. And I think I've shared before in workshops, it doesn't matter whether we ask for a lot or ask for less, kind of our number somewhere between that eight and nine million dollar range. I think we're averaging between 8.2, 8.4 million dollars. 
You can see way back in the beginning of this, we asked for 20, we received eight or nine. We asked for eight or nine, we get eight or nine. Uh, so that's kind of our placeholder to state as long as $250 million exists in a state pot. There's no formula to that, but history tells me there's, there's uh, some allocation that would indicate that's about our placeholder. This year, we will be asking for far less than $8 million of state money. So as we break this down a little bit, uh, in the next slide, you can see our state requests for this upcoming year will be $4,847,000. Again, that'll be our lowest request in the last 10 plus years. Locally, that would require a $4,290,000 match. The money that we've seen in the commissioner's budget so far is that $1,767,000. What also happens in the CIP, we show the next five years out. So as we move out into the next uh, year in FY18, you can see we've included the hub both locally and potentially at the state. Sharpsburg Elementary on the local side, we'd be into the planning stages for Sharpsburg. So architect fees, um, you know, site evaluations, those types of things will start to occur. And then we have systemic projects in the out years. Move out into 19. Uh, we continue potentially with the hub. In Sharpsburg, we begin with construction money and additional systemic projects on out into 20. Uh, continue with Sharpsburg and start to pick up the A&E fees for potentially Western Heights Middle School renovation. All of our middle schools, with the exception of Hicks, were uh, built in the 70s. Most of them for somewhere around the $3 million range. Uh, many of them, all of them, I guess, built with at least partial, if not fully, open schools, and they need a fair amount of work at this time. Look on out into 21. Uh, you see Sharpsburg again, Western Heights, and systemic projects, and then on out into 2022. And of course, a lot of this will change over time based on funding and what's available. Um, but that is part of the CIP process to let the state know what our needs are for the next five years. And with that, we'd be glad to entertain any questions you might have. And we are seeking your approval today uh, for state and local CIP. Thank you, Dr. Michael. As, uh, as Dr. Michael said, this is an action item and it requires a motion. Madam President, I move for the approval of the Capital Improvement Program plan for fiscal year 2017. Thank you, Dr. Harding. So second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Ridenauer. Floor is open for questions, comments. Mrs. Harshman. The uh, page that has the academic hub on to be determined, the amount to be determined, will this be filled in before this goes to the state? We're not asking for state money in FY17, so we actually could remove it from FY17. Uh, if we have dollar values for the out years, we would add that on to the uh, future projects. Really that 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 is just a heads up to the state. Um, they kind of compile that information, gives them from information to lobby for additional funding for the future but it won't have any effect on our FY17 requests for the state. So this isn't like getting a blank check. I wish we could get a blank check from the state, but no. <laughs> I wish we could, too. Okay, thank you. Additional questions? Mrs. Brightman? Yes. Uh, just a few comments on the, um, on the CIP, which I fully intend to support. Um, it, uh, to emphasize uh, some of what Dr. Michael has said on the projects that we're requesting state funding for, uh, we're, we're getting a, almost a, well, it depends on the specific project, but a one-to-one, -one, if not more than one-to-one -one match on uh, the funding that we request. Um, and most of these being systemic projects, that goes to something I guess I said when we had our work session on the Educational Facilities Master Plan, which is, there's a lot of ways somebody can define being fiscally conservative. One way to define it is to say you just don't spend any money or you spend as little money as possible. I think using this process to maximum advantage here 
is how I think we can be fiscally conservative because number one, we're caring for our assets, which are entrusted to us as a system to preserve for future generations. Um, because if you don't fix a roof now, and maybe it's a little leaky, some point down the road you have a mold problem and then you've got a real problem, which is gonna cost you a whole lot more money. And secondly, I don't know that there's any process in the county that brings more state dollars back into Washington County than this process. So for every dollar of local funds that are put in, whether it's from the county or from us, we're getting an additional dollar of state money, of course, some of which is Washington County tax money, but much of it comes from, from around the state too. So I think this is a good process. I think it's a responsible plan. And I think it's a fiscally conservative plan, uh, I guess depending on how it is that one defines fiscally conservative. But I think if you look at preserving your assets, making sure that you're making investments today that are gonna save you money in the long run, and being good stewards of taxpayer money in Washington County, um, I think this makes great sense and uh, I look forward to supporting it. Thank you to the facilities team for being so thoughtful uh, in bringing good projects that are gonna have a long-term impact on, on our facilities to us. Thank you. Other questions, Mr. Gasford? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, just for the, uh, the public out there, people will be asking if we voted on the academic hub today. Um, as my understanding is we are not voting on the academic hub. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Just to expand on that and, and, and staff, and, and I was going to bring that point up, so thank you, You're Mr. Welcome. Gasford. I think that speaks to Mrs. Harshman's question as well. Um, the Education Facility Master Plan and the CIP are documents that we review update and vote on every year and they change during from one year to the next so even though this document is dated 2017 to 2022 we're really only taking the 2017 slice and looking at the dollars for that right now um, so I hope that clarifies a little bit of your concern and, and Mrs. Harshman's as well. Um, back to the, the one slide that showed the local match at 4.29. <coughs> uh, to do everything we're looking at in the 2017 uh, list, I think you said that at this point the county has 1.1 on their CIP. So we're looking at about a $3 million delta of but being able to fund that entire list. Right. Well, we saw in their budget that they approved in May, um, their FY16 budget, and then they had some out years in their CIP. It did show $1,767,000 yet to 1. be contributed. 7. Yes, almost close to 1.8 towards the Jonathan Hager project. For systemic projects, they were showing zero for the next, I believe it was 10 years. Um, when we've asked county uh, staff about that, that is, their comment has been that is not to say that that zero will always remain zero and that they would certainly do what they can to increase that. Um, I think to your point, we need to lobby to have that zero changed. And that's or to Dr. Harding's point, we're gonna leave um, the opportunity to get that dollar for dollar, in some cases a dollar for two dollars, uh, we're going to leave that opportunity to some other county. And those are two of the points I was trying to, to sort of piggyback on to Dr. Harding's comments. I think we live in a, a very fiscally conservative county. We're very aware of that. And I think this school system and particularly the facilities does a great job of being very effective in uh, leveraging state dollars when we can and being very efficient in how we use and the savings that we're able to find and the protection of the investment that the county and the state have already made in, in these buildings. Um, I, I remain concerned that um, and agree that those zeros 
give us all pause. And so uh, I do think that I've heard from commissioners that indeed when money is available, every effort would be made to, to help change those zeros. And I take them at their word. Uh, we have a good relationship with, with the county and, and we plan to maintain a good working relationship. So um, one other just question, when you said the per square foot price was adjusted to 282, um, do they adjust this every year, every three years? Do they, how long does that run? Because I know it's sort of, it can be a lagging indicator sometimes. We've seen it go up and down. It's been as low since I've been on the board, maybe 230 or 40. 13 or something. Was it One down at, time, okay. Well, plus site work or something. Maybe 238 was like a low number that I can remember. Uh, I can okay. remember previously being Has in this it, job. Did even it, it ever go up to 300? During our building heyday, no. is this this is pretty. This is as high as this is. As high, that's what I was thinking. Okay, but again, I'm I'm sorry. Would this stay in place for a while? It could change every year. It is. Okay. Right. They review it every year. They don't change it every year, but they do. They it. do. They, they canvass the whole state and look at all the. And sort of average the price of average construction. And react to that. Okay. Very good. All right. Thank you. Any other questions, Mrs. Williams? Yes, um, I think I recall you saying, Dr. Michael, when you were showing this this graph that the past few years from the state we've gotten about eight million dollars. We we've averaged a little bit over eight million. Okay, Somewhere regardless 8 .2 of and 8 .4. regardless of what the ask was, that's that's what we've gotten, and yet we're asking far less than that this year, and. We have systemic projects that obviously need to be addressed. So I, I guess my thought is, why are we not asking for more than that to address those systemic pro, uh, projects? And is the reason because we've got that placeholder there for the, for the hub, or is it because we don't think that there's any chance that we're going to get that local match because of what you've just said about there being no money committed for that at this time. Right. On systemic projects, Mark Mills and his team go through every school every year and they look at all our, they can do an evaluation of the roof, the boiler, the chillers, uh, floor, you know, the conditions of all the buildings, and then they prioritize what our greatest needs are. At this point, this would be what we believe is a great, is our greatest need for systemic projects. There's nothing with the hub that's preventing us from asking for additional money. There is a concern, do we have the local match to do even this much? Okay, thank you. Okay, any additional questions? Everyone feels they have the information they need to, to make a decision. Okay, the question is on Dr. Harding's motion. All those in favor? None opposed, seven zero, and student concurs. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that is our final action item, new business this evening. We're moving into the superintendent's report. And recognize, well, I'll let you take it in whatever order. Thank you. Um, today we are privileged to have Tom Klein, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Big Brothers and Big Sisters of Washington County. He is here with us, and he has some folks with him who will come to the front, including one of our principals. Uh, Tom, I'm going to let you make this presentation, and we'll go from there. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wilcox, esteemed Board of Education. Welcome. Tom, we're going to ask you to sit down because we have to have you talk into the microphone. Absolutely. So Washington County Public Schools uh, significantly uh, supported our Bowl for Kids' Sake again this year with 18 teams contributing to the success of the day. I want to recognize and thank all the schools that participated, Birth to Five, Boonesboro Middle, E. Russell Hicks Middle, Fountaindale Elementary, Judy Center, Lincolnshire Elementary School, Pangborn Elementary School, Ruth Ann Monroe Primary School, Salem Avenue Elementary, South Hagerstown High School Key Club, and Western Heights Middle School. These teams were able to raise nearly $3,000. Pangborn Elementary School won the friendly competition between the schools participating for the second year in a row, raising nearly $800. I'm here today to recognize Mr. Meredith and Ms. Peppel for their leadership in supporting the event. 
At this time, I'd like to present them with a trophy and again, express our gratitude for their support. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Eric. As Mr. Meredith put it out, uh, school begins tomorrow, which is why they're having their <laughs> staff meeting and taking their trophy and running. Um, but it gives me great pleasure today to ask two of the uh, leaders within the school system to talk about our readiness for opening school tomorrow for our young people. So I'm going to ask Ms. Francisco to come forward along with Dr. Pugh. Ms. Francisco is our Chief Human Resources Officer and our Chief Academic Officer is Dr. Pugh. Uh, Laura, would you begin by talking about where we are? Thank you. Sure. I will be happy to give you just a brief uh, update on our staffing for the year. We welcomed all of our new teachers back. Or, no, we didn't welcome them back because they're new. We welcomed our new teachers last week at New Teacher Academy, and Dr. Pugh will speak a little bit more about that. Um, but it's a really nice three days that include um, a lot of learning for the new teachers, but um, the Greater Hagerstown Luncheon and also a welcome back picnic here at Central, uh, Center for Education Services. So we will be starting the school year uh, fully staffed in our classrooms. It's important to note that fully staffed doesn't necessarily mean that there won't be a long-term sub or two because we have people who are out on various leaves, um, but we do have classroom teachers for all of those classrooms. Um, we have, as of yesterday, 131 new hires and 131 total resignations, retirements. Those numbers do not often match up. It's just kind of serendipitous that they do. Again, we have teachers who move from teaching positions to administrative positions. We have teachers who are going out on leave or returning from a leave. So the numbers um, don't always match up, but this year they happen to. So um, that is a high, higher number of new teachers than last year, just by a few. Last year we had 127 new teachers. Um, and last year we had 99 total resignations and retirements. So the numbers are up a little, but they do tend to ebb and flow. So, And then we've had four major events in August in preparing for the return of our students. We held an opening leadership council for all of our administrators and principals and assistant principals on August 5th and 6th. We held a new teacher academy, which was a series of events um, from August 10th through the 12th. We had our elementary supervisor professional development day on Friday, August 14th. And yesterday, we held our final professional development day with our secondary um, teachers. Prior to those opportunities, we had approximately 80 of the new teachers voluntarily attend new teacher induction workshops um, on common core shifts and the framework for teachers, which is how they'll be evaluated prior to them beginning with us in New Teacher Academy. We had approximately 122 new teachers attending the new teacher induction. And at that point, they were provided with the superintendent's vision of great teaching, the new curriculum, evaluation, certification, human resources protocols, uh, technology, inclusive of our acceptable use policy. They had training to support students' medical needs. They had curricular training and access to all resources digitally versus the, uh, via the Google Docs. We had at those events 33 community vendors attending, including the credit union, MetLife, and AXA. Also, the Teachers Association, as you heard um, Mr. Becker speak, had a designated meeting time with the new teachers. Over 90 teachers attended the new teacher picnic, where they were impressed with the positive and inclusive culture of Washington County Public Schools. They appreciated the welcoming comments at the picnic by the superintendent and our board representative. We thank you for that. Uh, formal supports for these new teachers will continue on a monthly basis uh, for teachers and non-traditional uh, staff through this new teacher induction program, which is more than just the, the beginning. These professional development opportunities that we held for the administrators and all of our teachers were designed to de deliver the same message and to begin to develop a common language for Washington County. The professional development design helped our teachers and administrators achieve our goals of speaking in the same language. At least one administrator from every secondary school visit us, visited us yesterday, and the most popular comment was, this is just what we did at council. 
and they appreciated seeing the similarities between what they had heard, the information they heard, and what we were talking to teachers about. <clears throat> Cohesiveness is a focus for this year, establishing through all levels. And we were asking the question in both elementary and secondary that if students have the knowledge and skills needed to be successful, then what can we do with it beyond just basic skills? The Division of Instruction has set the ex expectations for working on an understanding-focused cur curriculum, which is based on skill application rather than a coverage-focused curriculum uh, focused on a total amount of skills. That doesn't mean the skills are not crucial and critical. They are, but it was more about what can students do with this information? How can they actively use it? We also talked about the design, the backwards design process that we'll be using and the fact that stakeholders, including students and teachers, will have input in refining our instructional plan as we move forward. This cyclical planning process that we are using is based on teachers' feedback and students' reactions to the tasks that call for our, our students to use their knowledge and skills in new and authentic situations. Our elementary teachers are prepared to begin implementation of a revised curriculum, and they collaboratively plan their first learning experience for students. Secondary teachers are just beginning the curriculum work to weave that thread of coherence through our pre-K to 12 programs so that we have a guaranteed and viable curriculum for all of our students. Early learning is ready to take a big step forward in truly preparing students for the rigors ahead, specifically in reading through the direct instruction of concepts of print. The feedback we've just begun reviewing, but provided by participants, it gave us a clear direction as to potential next steps to continue our efforts to move forward. The teachers did seem to value working with teachers of other schools, and one of the comments was, we would never have been able to do this if we stayed at our home schools. We'll look at our forms and look at making sure that we provide opportunity for open comments, and we are prepared and excited and ready for our students tomorrow. Well, thank you very much for that report. Um, I would give the board members an opportunity to ask a question if you had any. Um, other than that, I'm going to move on to the next topic. Is there anything? All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, just two uh, items that I want to bring up. Number one is school does begin tomorrow for students. Uh, every family in the district that has a listed telephone number from us. We'll be getting a call from me welcoming them back to the school district tonight and reminding them that the school does start bright and early tomorrow morning. Um, as most of you know, we have published our bus routes. Um, we have talked as an administrative staff about how we can support families in getting to and from school so we'll be out and on the road um, and really trying to monitor throughout the day how well school comes in. We're meeting back here at about 2.30 in the afternoon to get some sense of how our opening day went. But right now, given the planning and the reports back, I think we'll be in very good position. Uh, the last thing that I have today is um, that as you discussed the CIP program, I wanted to remind you of not long ago, um, we were presented with a study of the economic value of uh, the expenditures that school systems make or this organization, Washington County Public Schools, makes when it embarks on a new project. And I was simply reminded in, in the conversation of a couple of numbers that jumped out at me. And that was that for every dollar that we spend in redeveloping, redesigning our facilities, building new construction, that dollar turns over in the economy um, and it yields about a dollar and 30 cents worth of economic value as economists kind of track the money as it moves through the uh, local economy. The other thing uh, that stuck out uh, at me is, is that when you take a look at every million dollars that the school district spends on construction, um, the number that they tossed out was that it creates, not necessarily in direct construction, but even in indirect support of the construction, 16 new jobs for every million dollars. So. Um, once again, this probably goes to the point that Dr. Hardings was making, um, that uh, there are many ways that you can view the economic participation of the school system within the larger community. Um, one might say that it would be best for us not to spend our resources, not to do things to keep our buildings in shape. Others might say it's best to spend money in a way that is uh, fiscally responsible and prudent. Uh, 
I would tend to fall in that later, latter category. And then the last thing that I had uh, today was uh, uh, Dr. Hardy's was a little bit humble uh, earlier in the day when he spoke about the opportunity we had for the uh, science equipment coming from OpGen. Um, it should be noted that OpGen didn't approach the school district directly. The uh, OpGen approached Dr. Hardings, um, and Dr. Hardings forwarded that uh, approach to me, and then I was able to work with our science team uh, so that those dollars um, and those materials would come here. So I want to thank you publicly, Dr. Hardings, uh, for referring that. Uh, that just shows the, the good work that this board does uh, with its local community. So thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, Okay, personnel action. Mrs. Francisco. Mrs. Brightman, Dr. Wilcox, members of the board. As discussed earlier in closed session this afternoon, there are several uh, personnel actions for your review and approval. Thank you. Requiring a motion. Madam President, I move for the approval of personnel actions as recommended by staff. And a second. Second. Mr. Ridenauer, thank you. All those in favor? Those opposed? Four in support, three opposed. The motion moves forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, reports to the board. Mr. Ridenauer, I believe you're first this afternoon. Yes, uh, HR department will not be meeting. HR committee will not be meeting this month. Um, Ms. Francisco said they have very little that they have, and it can wait until the following month, the end of the month of September, we will meet again. Very good. Mrs. Fisher, policy? Yes, policy committee met August the 10th. Um, we reviewed some changes to policy JH. Um, based on some state changes, actually. Um, staff is reworking the policy, and we'll bring it back to us at the next meeting. Um, we recommended rescission of three policies presented earlier today because they're not current, and we believe they are better placed in a handbook for board members. Um, they also need to reflect our vision. We looked at policy DBK, Budget Transfer Authority, and we sent that to appropriate staff to analyze it for consistency with both state laws and our practices. Um, we also recommended the rescission of IGBA, uh, Programs for Handicapped Students, um, and we are having policy CBI, School Superintendent Evaluation, put into its proper form we're also will be will be recommending rescission of the exhibit that goes with that particular policy. Um, we've kind of decided to set aside for a short time the remaining policies in the I section um, to allow the instructional staff uh, time to deal with the opening of school because they're so involved with that particular section of our policies. Um, and to work on some other things we need to finish up and also get started on the um, handbook that uh, um, Mr. Trotta talked about earlier in his pre presentation to us. We will be meeting August 28th at 9 a.m. and uh, it's an open meeting. Anyone's interested, free to join us. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Gessford, Finance. Yes, the Finance Committee will be meeting. Um, sorry, my microphone's not on. The Finance Committee will be meeting uh, next Tuesday upstairs in the third floor conference room at uh, 1045. Very good, thank you. Um, Mrs. Williams, facilities. Yes, facilities will be meeting Tuesday, August 25th at noon in the Deputy Superintendent's conference room. I'm unable to attend, and President um, Brightman has agreed to chair the meeting in my absence. Thank you. Ms. Harshman, CNI. Curriculum and instruction will meet September 25th, 12 o'clock in the board conference room. The public is invited and the agenda will be posted. Thank you. Ms. Greenwall. Um, WCSC is prepping for our first General Assembly on September 15th. 
and we have an executive board meeting on August 31st to plan the GA. Very good, thank you. And good luck with your first day of school tomorrow. Thank you. Right. Mrs. Brightman, yes. can I ask a question for clarification? Yes. M Mrs. Harshman said that the curriculum committee was meeting on September 25th. Did, did you mean August Sorry. 25th? Thank you for catching us. You bet. Perfect. Thank While you. we're on that topic, I may have said the policy committee meets the 28th. It's the 25th. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Now we're all set. Any other reports from MABE or other meetings? Yes, Ms. Harshman. We have our uh, last May conference planning committee meeting um, in September, and then we'll be all set for the end of September and the beginning of October for the conference in Ocean City. And hopefully all board members throughout Maryland will be able to attend. Thank you. Ms. Williams, anything from Mabe? OK. Uh, the only other. Uh, Minor comment, really. The legislative response team did meet this morning briefly to start developing an agenda for the legislative uh, work session that is scheduled for September 1st. Okay. Um, future agenda items. September 1st, again, we do have that work session at 9 a.m. on the identification of legislative priorities, our core values, pretty much the same system that we used last year, the last several years uh, following policy. Um, I think the other reminder would be that, again, our third, second meeting of September will not be on the 15th, but rather on September 22nd. So hopefully no one will show up at the wrong time. We also have a joint meeting with the county commissioners uh, to start the day off at 1 p.m. at the county administration building. So I think that brings us to board member comments, and I'll start with Mr. Reidenauer. Mrs. Fisher. Just that um, those big yellow buses will be rolling tomorrow. People need to watch out for them, be alert, protect our ch children. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Gasford. Thank you. Uh, just a couple thank yous going out there. Uh, as we've uh, been traveling Washington County recently, we see the coaches of the football teams, the soccer teams that have been out on the field. Um, and we want to thank those folks. Uh, for their dedication, but also the ones are there volunteering their time. Um, there are a lot of coaches out there who get off early to go out there to the fields and help uh, coach, and uh, you know, they are volunteers. And uh, as hot as it was the last couple days, um, we do appreciate them. Uh, and also would like to uh, thank the band directors who are, have worked very hard over the summer to get their field shows ready and uh, dealing with and juggling with vacations with families. And uh, so uh, just a shout out to those, those fine uh, band directors who are working very hard to get field shows and uh, their, their music ready for the season. So thank you. Very good. Thank you. Dr. Hardings. Yes, I have several items. Uh, last Tuesday, uh, the 11th, I attended a discussion at the, was at the Monarch Academy School, which was in uh, the city of Baltimore. Uh, I mentioned at the last board member comments that I would be going there uh, with, at the invitation of Senator Rosapep to look at a uh, innovative school. It's a, a school built uh, by a company on a contract in an old Coca-Cola bottling plant. Uh, it's a very creative use, or I guess adaptive reuse of an old facility. Uh, they had do some really creative things with the artwork inside the buildings. That's one of the things that grabbed me is the people who built it said they budget $7 per square foot for just artwork and things on the walls to engage kids. Uh, and you can really tell when you saw it. Uh, I think his motivation for having me there was um, to discuss 
ways to school, build schools uh, in a less expensive way. I think he's particularly fascinated or interested in our model for the Barbara Ingram School and the academic hub. And he thought there would be some synergy there. So it was a great discussion. Thank him for the opportunity to come. I have some literature on the, the Monarch Academy. If anybody's interested in seeing it, I will leave it in the uh, board conference room. I don't have it with me today, so it may be by the end of the week before I can get it in there. But I'll be sure to have it in there before committee meetings next week. Um, I got an email from uh, Senator Rosa Pep's staff last week uh, saying that he is going to be in Washington County and would like to see the technical high school. So he will be here on Thursday at 1030 if any board members are interested in attending. Uh, I think uh, It'll be the first day for some students there, so I'm not sure how much will be going on. It might be a little bit of chaos, but he, uh, he's heard of the reputation of our technical high school, knows we do some very innovative things there, and just wanted to come and see. So all board members are welcome to attend that. I'd like to thank the Greater Hagerstown Committee for their sponsorship of the new Educator Lunch last week on Monday. It was well attended. Uh, many members of the community, elected officials, uh, I hope it made the teachers feel welcome. I certainly enjoyed it. As uh, Mrs. Brightman mentioned, I enjoyed uh, spending a few minutes with Mr. Becker and uh, some of the teachers that he will represent uh, as we move forward. Also want to thank, oh, I enjoyed seeing as well all the 403B vendors who were there trying to recruit uh, um, clients, I suppose is the right word. Uh, so I, it was nice to see that competition based on uh, the change in the plan that we generated last year. And finally, I'd like to thank Dr. Wilcox and the staff for the new teacher picnic last week. Uh, again, it was an event where people just sort of stayed around because I think they were having a good time. A lot of principals there interacting with new teachers, interacting with each other, new teachers and their families there. It again was a great event, I think, to make these new employees feel like they're welcome uh, in our system. So thanks to the food and nutrition staff and everybody who was involved. I think Jamie Hayde was led that up for the staff. So thanks to all for making that just a super event. And fortunately, the, uh, the weather even held up for us. So that's all I've got. Thank you. Mrs. Williams. Yes, just a few thank yous. I'd like to thank all those who've worked so hard this summer to ready our schools for tomorrow's opening. I'd like to thank all those who have been in their classrooms preparing their classrooms and their instructional spaces for our students tomorrow. And I'd like to wish everyone a great school year. Mrs. Harshman. I'd like to welcome back our dedicated returning employees. And I'd like to welcome to Washington County all our new hires. I know that you are willing and able to do your very best to ensure the success of our students. And if you have any problems, if you have any questions, if you have any concerns, please remember we are your elected officials and we are here to listen. So feel free to contact any of us at any time. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Greenwald. Yeah, um, last Tuesday, I was able to attend the new student member board orientation at MABE. Um, in Annapolis, and it was a really awesome opportunity. We um, talked a lot about um, some of the new, I guess, issues that's coming up in this next year, the Common Core, um, IEP, stuff like that, and how that affects um, not even like the State Board of Education, but every like individual Board of Ed. Um, and they had some awesome speakers, and it was so interactive and just a really great opportunity. And I was very thankful to have been able to attend. Excellent. Thank you. Dr. Wilcox. Just to wish everybody great luck tomorrow. Uh, I think people are well prepared. I think we'll have a great opening. And I look forward to a terrific year with this board as we support our teachers, our support staff members, and our administrators. So thank you. Thank you. Um, just a few comments. Uh, I was thinking as preparing for the meeting today, uh, we have a particularly, I think, important policy, a brand new one, JICJ. Uh, about the use of personally owned electronic devices. And I thought that it would be uh, of interest and, and of use possibly to just share the purpose and the statement. Um, 
the purpose of it, the Board of Education encourages the use of personally owned electronic devices as a part of a student's normal academic program. The purpose of this policy is to establish criteria regarding that use. A student's use, and this is under the statement or policy statement, a student's use of a personally owned electronic device during the school day is designed to help him or her become a responsible digital citizen, to embrace classroom activities, and to provide authentic experiences to build skills such as collaboration, creativity, communication, and critical thinking. These skills aid in preparing a student for 21st century college and career demands. So I know um, there will be, I'm sure, a transition or a uh, getting adjusted to the new policy, uh, but I, I think this will be something that is very representative of practice throughout the school system. Um, one just final comment, sort of on a story or narrative. I, I don't know how many of you listen to TED Talks. I do on occasion, sort of my own personal um, inspiration, I guess. But Ken Robinson, uh, a Brit who's been involved in education for a long time, uh, spoke briefly, um, I think I heard it yesterday or the day before, about how education needs to be less linear and more organic. And it's not evolving, but it should be more of a revolution. And he gave just a very simple story, which I'll share, uh, I thought was pretty moving. Um, he was talking to some young people about their career choices. And this one young man said, well, all throughout school, I kept telling counselors and teachers that I wanted to be a fire and rescue, a first responder. That's what I wanted to do. And of course, he said they all kind of dismissed it because every little boy and sometimes little girls say, I want to be a fireman. And um, he said, it's really what I wanted to do. It was my mindset. It was my skill set. It, it's what I wanted to do. And one teacher finally came up to him and said to him, you're really too smart. You need to go to college and you need to uh, become a professional. And basically, he uh, was non-compliant, and uh, as some young people are, and he graduated high school, went on, and became certified uh, in fire and rescue. And I guess a few years passed, and he was at the scene of an accident, and he saved a man and his wife's life at this accident. And it turned out to be the same teacher who tried to dissuade him not to follow his dreams and did not value his dreams. So as we look at school, the first day of school, I would say we really, as educators and advocates for education, need to remember that every child has their own particular unique value. And we need to recognize that. And um, it's not one standard or one answer for every child. So those are my thoughts for the evening. I appreciate my colleagues' hard work today. And uh, we are at the end of our agenda. And we are adjourned. Thank you.